Hello and welcome back to Offspring Magazine, the podcast. I'm your host, Rinath Ramkumar, and with me again today is Nikolai Herman. Hi, everyone. And today we're going to be talking to another person who's following in our journey through a doctorate. So she's about to finish her PhD, Doctor, almost Dr. Noemi Albert Bond, and whose work relies around the culture of research. And she does research on research. How interesting is that? Yes, I mean, she's basically looking into uh, what it's like to do research and uh, also what people think about it. So what the good things are, what the bad things are, and, and so on, yeah. That's uh, it's pretty nice. So she just about submitted her thesis, if I'm not wrong. Yes. And we saw that we got to uh, talk to her during the Open Access Ambassadors Conference, which yes. was organized by Nico last year. And uh, so uh, we just got to talking and I think we realized that we have a lot of common interests, especially with the field of research evaluation, research yeah. integrity, which uh, is more or less the crux of our thesis. Yes, I mean, it's, it's very interesting because, I mean, as researchers, we should always be critical of uh, what we're doing, right? And mm -hmm. we also, of course, should be critical of the way we're doing things. And I think her uh, work is addressing this uh, so this is quite nice to hear about. Yeah. So I think uh, without any further delay, let's just get on with the discussion with Noemi. And uh, a quick tip for anyone who's counting the number of times we mentioned research in this uh, episode. If you count it and let us know, we may have a surprise gift for you. <laughs> Noemi, thanks for joining us for this uh, discussion. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, so maybe as a first uh, point, could you maybe just give us an introduction to who you are and what you are doing? Uh, yes, sure. Okay, so I'm a PhD student. Uh, I initially come from Canada. Uh, I've lived in Canada most of my life. Uh, and I was studying... There, I was studying cognitive neuroscience, but at some point I changed fields, and now I'm a PhD student studying in Belgium, in Hasselt University in Belgium, and I study research on research. Okay, and what made you switch? So, uh, wait, as far as I remember, your master's degree was something completely different, right? Yeah, yeah. So, that was a very big decision for me. So, basically, I since I'm very young, I've always known I wanted to be a researcher. Um, I, my father was a researcher. I always liked research. And uh, one thing that fascinated me was how the brain works. So I did all of my studies in psychology, neuroscience, and um, I did a whole uh, bachelor's degree in cognitive neuroscience, then a master's in psychiatry. And I loved it. It was really, really interesting. Um, but at some point during my master's degree, I realized that the thing that they asked the most out of me was to publish. Like I would start a, a research project and the thing that would come first was how many papers are you going to do from this project? That was really the, the only important thing from my research was how many papers I'm going to publish uh, how many lines I'm going to add on my CV. And so even though I really like neuroscience, uh, I thought that it was kind of weird that I want to be a researcher. I want to contribute to the knowledge or how we understand our brain and how we understand humans. But in the end, everything I'm doing, I'm doing it for me and for my CV. So at that point, I decided that I wanted to do something to look at how science works. And I wanted to uh, try to understand why publishing in science is so important and try to change uh, how science is, what science is requesting from researchers. 
So that's why I changed fields. Um, initially, I uh, worked as a scientific editor for a little bit um, in London at the Cochrane Library. And I was working on uh, policies for publishing. And that was a, a, an eye-opener also because I was uh, contributing to a lot of conferences in uh, publication ethics and understanding that in the end, scientific publishing has a lot more issues than what I thought. It's not just about publishing a lot, but it's also there's a lot of biases and a lot of things coming into play. And what we publish in science is not necessarily the whole truth. So I got super involved and super interested in that topic. And I decided to continue in that area. So I did a master's of bioethics, looking at research integrity, and then a PhD on uh, uh, research integrity, but l going more towards research assessments. And that's where I am at. Okay, nice. And uh, just uh, maybe a follow up to uh, your study. So you were mentioning you were very interested in neuroscience. And I mean, me being in neuroscience, uh, I can definitely understand. So I just wanted to ask if you maybe if you regret the decision or if you're happy at the position you're at, because yeah. Well, yeah, I, I miss it. I'll be honest, mm -hmm. I miss it. Because, you know, when you read an article that's, especially now with the new technologies that are happening and with AI and like there's so much interesting research out there and I kind of regret because the more it, it goes and the less I can read the articles like I I find it more challenging to read the articles because I don't know about the new technologies and everything so I regret that part but at the same time I I really wanted to change how I do science and I think I would not have been I would not have been able to continue in neuroscience because I'm not someone who wants to publish a lot. And I would have made that point my entire life. And I would have lived a whole, like a fight <laughs> for my entire career. So I'm glad I changed, but I do, I miss it. Okay. I, that's no question. Yeah. I see. Okay. Thanks uh, yeah, for the honesty. Um, so, Yeah, it's concerning your PhD project then. So, I mean, you're talking a lot about research integrity. So I think the first good point would be just to define what research integrity is for you. Because, I mean, I'm actually not too familiar with uh, the the phrase. So maybe that would be great if you could do that. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a challenging question, actually. It shouldn't be because it's my topic of research. Um, but it's quite hard to define integrity. Uh, Most of the time, integrity is defined by what it is not. So you, by misconduct, basically, you say you have to be a researcher who acts with integrity by not committing misconduct. Um, but in general, integrity means um, to be true to yourself. Like that's the, the original meaning. It means uh, to behave in a way that you are full and you don't have flaws. That's like the etymology of integrity. And in research, what it really means is to be honest, to be transparent, so that everything you do goes along your wish to contribute to science. Um, so it's not just not committing misconduct, but it's also all of your behaviors and everything that you do should be done with this ultimate goal in mind and, and with respect of honesty and, and uh, transparency. But so one thing that's uh, really important to understand is that you don't just have integrity and misconduct, but it's a whole gray area between the two. So you have uh, pure integrity, which is what we should all aim for but of course nobody is completely pure in science and there are some things that we do out of self selfish interest or out of uh, just because we think it's more fun but it's not necessarily better to advance science and there are there is misconduct when we willfully do bad science to uh, help ourselves And, and that's very selfish behaviors. But in between, there's a whole gray area where you're like, 
you do something that's not completely transparent, but it's not misconduct and everybody does it. So where, where are you situated in that? So all to say integrity is pretty difficult to define, but it's a whole area of behaviors. Um, in, and it's really about what researchers practice in, in their science. So your research was mainly focused on research integrity and identifying trends among researchers. So what was the major learning from all of the work that you did? Yeah, um, okay, so so my research looked at uh, research integrity. I started by looking really at research integrity and I did a big literature review in the beginning of my project. To So it was like research on research on research. So it was like a meta meta <laughs> research. It was really fun. And um, what I found from that meta research was that when we talk about integrity, um, we often don't, well, we don't really, we know what is happening, but we don't really know how to address the problem. So we know there is misconduct. We know there are bad research practice that we call questionable research practices, but we don't know how to solve the issue. And at the same time, there's a lot of uh, universities that are putting together courses and trainings, and they're saying, by training our researcher, we're going to fight integrity. But the research that finds why misconduct happens says it's not because people don't know uh, it's because the system is wrong and the system has wrong incentives and and it, it's putting pressure on researchers and the researchers feel pushed to commit misconduct. So this is what is happening. But the solution that we have right now is to train researchers, which is kind of wrong, right? It's like you have someone who's very sick uh, because of something in his environment and instead of changing the environment you you put a plaster on 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 him you know so like we're kind of missing the problem so that was the basis of my research and i i decided then to tackle the system so uh, i did interviews and focus groups and then a survey to understand what is the main problem uh, in science and what i found uh, was that the, the main problem is in research assessment. It's in how uh, we evaluate, how we assess researchers. And that's really uh, the key issue. But there's also more issues around that because then you say, okay, we have the problem, so let's solve it. But I also realized that to solve it, it's extremely complex because it, it, changing research assessment involves a lot of different research actors and they all need to be involved at the same time and to say, okay, all together right now from tomorrow, we're not looking at impact factors anymore, but we're looking at open access. Like everybody has to agree at the same time. So it's super complex. Um, so what I realized is that we need more discussion between actors and uh, we need researchers to be more involved with different research actors uh, to be able to really change the research system. But I think maybe we'll talk a bit more about research assessments later on, so I don't want to give you too much detail. No, so what do you mean by the different actors in research and research assessment, I guess? Yeah, well, um, so in my project, well, I'll, term in terms of, I'll talk in terms of what I looked at, but I look at uh, policymakers, so like at the government, they have a role on how science is organized. So I looked at policymakers, funders, journals, uh, university directors, so I call them leaders of universities, then also researchers, research students, uh, young researchers, uh, lab technicians. So I, I was trying to get all the levels uh, of people that are involved in science that create this scientific system that we always talk about. Of course, I missed some people like uh, what about um, research ethics committees? I didn't involve them, but they also have a role to play. So there's a million actors, but I think the key ones for for changing research assessments are really policymakers, funders, research universities, uh, and then all the research producers, so researchers, research students, uh, 
tenure researchers, emeritus researchers, and all of these things. So these are really the key actors that really need to talk. Uh, with when one generally, were there answers? What kind of questions did you ask them as a first point? And may, were their answers somewhat similar to each other? Like they all kind of pointed towards the same issues, or were they widely different? Uh, yeah, so the first question I would ask them is, uh, what is a successful researcher? So really to get like their personal view of, of success in science. And um, I thought I would find more difference between actor groups. Uh, most of the difference I found was between persons, so like different personalities. Uh, but there was a lot of difference in in the responses I got. So some people, for them, success is prestige. It's really recognition. It's people applauding your work and, and loving what you do. For other people, it's changing how people practice medicine. It's changing things in the clinic. It's really going into applied society. And for other people, it's... Uh, um, being involved in in a lot of inter international collaborative projects so so i realized that success is very complex and it's not there's no definition of success actually but the problem is we always evaluate success but we never define it so that's something that i realized that maybe we should pay attention to so one thing we should maybe clarify is your research was in the biomedical uh, sector yeah. and um so one thing that basically you were saying that it was less dependent on the actor or the, the party where the actor is from, but rather on the personal view on like success in this case yeah. uh, that determined what the person actually wanted. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I found some actor relationship because I asked about success, but then I also asked about the problems of science. And I asked, for example, what causes misconduct? What is misconduct? What is bad science? Uh, and in these areas, I found more of an actor uh, factor. So, so for example, uh, the universities and, and the research integrity officers, uh, they tend to blame misconduct on the personal intentions, whereas the journals tend to say, we don't care about the intention, but we care about the truth in the data and how the data changes the scientific record. So there I found some actor relations, but in general, yeah, it was mostly personal. Okay, that's okay, interesting wow. to hear. Yeah, I didn't expect that, uh, yeah, the different, like, that it's so dependent on the person itself. Um, because that means that basically in all ranks, you can say there's basically people that will do a lot more than just uh, publish their, like, truthful data uh, to become successful, I guess. Um, okay, um, so one thing that you were mentioning is that uh, misconduct or bad science is basically, it's a spectrum. It's not just, okay, this is bad science and this is good science. Yeah. And um, um, that people usually also, sorry, uh, that people also know uh, that they're actually doing bad science sometimes, but they still do it to advance their careers. So basically, um, as we were already getting a bit into it, advancing a scientific career is basically what a lot of people want uh, when they are PhDs, right? Yeah, so, well, I mean, there's not much choice, right? Because if you, if you don't, so I'll, I'll go back to, to my misconduct and questionable research practices. So, we know that grossly uh, there have been a, bun a bunch of, um, of reviews and literature reviews uh, based on surveys that showed that around 1% to 3% of researchers admit that they've committed misconduct. And by misconduct, I mean falsifying, fabricating data or committing plagiarism. So that, that's, okay, that's still shocking, but it's pretty low. But 33%, so almost a third of researchers, admit that they've committed questionable research practices. And um, questionable research practices, when you read about them, actually, I, I think 
like it, it's not so surprising that so many people admit to committing them. One one example is not publishing a research because the results were negative. So it is questionable. You should not be allowed to do that because your research was funded. You have the results, but so many people do it because they don't know how to publish their negative results. So, so all to say, questionable research practices are very common, but they're also what we learn will make us successful. So uh, it's not badly intentioned people, but it's how we learn to succeed in science. It becomes part of the game. It becomes part of the, the rules of what will keep us our career, what will keep us our job. So I don't think you can really say these people were just thinking about their careers. I think you can say these people learned that this was what they had to do in a way. And I think that's why I want to tackle the system and not not the personal researchers and say they were wrong, but we really have to change the system because it's the system that is pushing the researchers to do these things. Mm -hmm. So uh, you mentioned that it's the system, right? So because... So my question here is, if there is someone who feels pressure to alter data in order to make it seem like it's positive data mm -hmm. or rather than when it is actually a negative data, so that, it, that, it, that is misconduct, plain and simple. Yeah. But yeah. Are there, is there a different kind of misconduct which is not, or like questionable practice, which is not so like visible on the surface that somehow you know do people have this tendency that they think yeah okay if i do this i can get away with it yeah or if i do this i can get away so so you know the the ideology that they can get away with it uh or game the system in yeah. a way that is beneficial to them yeah and so this has been ingrained in the way they do the manipulation or whatever it is so is there so my my i don't think i'm getting at a question here my question is uh do all of so is there a is there like a range of different kinds of practices and is there a way that different stakeholders look at it differently is it like is this okay for now we can deal with this later because we want to deal with this first or is there is there some sort of uh, yeah, like a gradient there. Maybe as an add-on, is there something that is like okay in a whole field, for example, like one whole oh. field that does a certain thing in a certain way because that's. But yeah. although it might be a questionable research practice. Yeah, that uh, that's a good question. That's a lot of questions. <laughs> I'm not sure. I have Sorry the for that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I have the answer. Um, but you touch on a good point. So so for sure. Like, let's say you said changing your data so that it becomes positive. That's wrong, right? We all know that's wrong. But taking out a few outliers, like, where does it become acceptable? And then, and then you can always find a reason to take out a few outliers. Or, or just not having an hypothesis when you start, and then suddenly you have an hypothesis in the end and you predict it right. Like, all these things are questionable. They're, they're not you cannot unanimously say this is wrong, uh, but they're questionable. Um, if in a whole field or in a whole area or certain actors think that these practices are acceptable, I don't know. I really don't know. I My research doesn't have an answer for that. I don't think there is, but I would doubt. I would doubt it. I think it depends on the lab. It depends on on how the supervisor trains you and how they see what is research. Uh, do they think that it depends on their methods, how they're trained and, and do they register their result, their, their research before gathering results and all of these things. I think it, it's more dependent on the person again. Mm -hmm. But uh, speaking about the biomedical sciences field, especially if you look at animal research, the number of animals that people usually use is fairly less in comparison to the number of, uh, let's say, if you do an economics where you can have 100,000, 200,000 people questioned, mm -hmm. right? So my, my general question is, do you think it makes it easy easier in bio biomedical sciences for people to, let's say, do pee hacking or certain... Yeah activities like that which will somehow enable like removing outliers removing certain data points which will somehow enable them to show more stronger data in quotes 
Well, well, that's an interesting point. I wouldn't know, but I think you might be right. Most of the research on research integrity has been done on the biomedical field. Uh, I think it's it's because of the interest for like what we do wrong has a direct impact on on people's health. So we have a straight interest in there. Um, but what you say is not stupid also because we also the fact that we live with living animals, living people, so that's what we study. So it's quite easy to to have different results or to explain differences. Um, I'm not sure it incites more wrongdoings, but I think it is harder to share your data. It is harder to verify your data, to replicate your study. That's for sure. That's mm. for sure. Yeah, I mean, this whole replication crisis that is is happening, was happening, mm -hmm. um, is kind of, yeah, it's kind of showing that. Probably will still continue to happen. Uh, no. <laughs> Hopefully not, I mean. Uh, not for too long, let's hope. But, you know, uh, given, uh, it's just that there is, uh, I just want to make this point that there is a need for change and yeah. we want everyone to be involved in this need for change. It's not enough if a few of us are yelling at some people. It's just that everyone has to be actively involved. Yeah. You don't want this to be the Greta Thunberg effect, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a super important okay. point. Yeah. So um, maybe moving on a bit, uh, what would you say are like some uh, incentives that uh, people can set for people to uh, for researchers to follow more the good scientific practices instead of. Um, yeah, uh, giving in to pressure and so on to advance their careers, I guess, or conduct misconduct. Well, okay. Um, <laughs> conduct misconduct. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, so, so I really think we have to change research assessment. That's, mm -hmm. that's not a big surprise. And I think my research is not even, my findings are not even surprising. But we have to look at something else than just the research output. So right now we measure success in terms of research output and more specifically in terms of number of publication and impact factor where the publications are published. So that's our limited definition of success. And that's really bad because then you just look at what at the output. You don't look at how the research was done. Uh, was it open? Was it transparent? Was it registered? Uh, what else does the researcher do? Do they peer review? Do they help uh, high school students learn about the topic? Like, you don't look about, you don't look at anything else than just the publications or or almost nothing else. So that's the main thing that we have to change, I think, at the moment. Um, and I think if we said instead of looking at impact high impact factor journal publications um, if we say okay let's look at how open the publications are let's let's reward open data sharing uh, let's reward peer review let's reward all of these other activities well that's that's clearly um, a way into helping researchers behave better and and, and feel good about uh, doing good science and doing high quality science. I mean, do you think it will be possible to evaluate all of these things? Because I think it will, it's generally the output is the most graspable thing, right? I mean, you know, this thing was published by these people. It describes who did what. And with, for example, teaching, it will be very hard uh, mm -hmm. to know, I mean, who put the slides together. Sometimes it doesn't even, isn't even the PI that gives a lecture or like during teaching, uh, you yeah. have to ask in theory, even the all the students that were taught by that one person, if they were a good supervisor or not. Yeah. So it just adds up and so on. So yeah. do you think, uh, like, I mean, publications are the most established. They're, and also they're re easily quantitative. You yeah. can put yeah. a number to so it. But do you think that others can be assessed in a similar way or? Uh, well, I hope so. And I think it's happening. It's happening mm -hmm. now. So oh, okay, nice. I can give you some examples of mm -hmm. places. But I just want to say two things because publications are quantitative you can get a simple number like even the h index which is still in use in some countries and some institutions it's one number assigned to a researcher's head like that's the simplest thing you can do and the 
evaluators have the impression that they're more impartial because then they just have a number. It's not their decision who is the best. It's that number. That number is going to say it for them. So that's really easy. Uh, it's also not time consuming and uh, it's very straightforward. And everybody, there's kind of a cultural agreement on these indicators right now. So, so I agree with you. This is why it's in practice right now. Um, but I also think that, you know, research is based on trust. Uh, we, when we read a paper, exactly like we said, we don't replicate the research to make sure the researcher was right and is saying the truth. Like we trust each other and that's really the basis of how science works. So why don't institutions trust researcher too and ask them what is really important for them, what they did in their career. Like ask them for a portfolio, a narrative of what are their accomplishments and then take the time to read some papers and to evaluate these things. It, it's becoming more and more accepted that this should be uh, the future of scientific evaluation. It's more time consuming. It is. Uh, but at the same time, it's more fair for the researchers. So if you want some examples, go on the DORA website. So DORA is the Declaration on Research Assessments, and I think it's pretty important to mention here. Uh, so a few years ago, some researchers got together and decided, OK, we have to do something about this research assessment mess. And they wrote a declaration. And the declaration says that we shouldn't use the impact factor for individual researchers' evaluation and that we shouldn't use other reducing metrics, that we should look at more than just the papers, and etc. It's very good. Uh, I would recommend that you go read it online. But they also have a website, and on the website there's a blog, and the blog talks about innovative actions in research assessments, and they describe changes in, in several universities. So, for example, last year, there was uh, the Netherlands that decided that throughout their universities, they would all sign the DORA and they would start looking at researchers in a different way. So they look at different pillars of researchers' life and researchers can decide on one of these pillars to, to specialize in a pillar. For example, specialize more in teaching and in outreach, but not so much in, in publications and, and research itself. So it's getting more diverse. So the same things happen in some universities in Australia, in the UK, uh, also in Ghent University, right next to where I am in Belgium. So I would say we can be optimistic for the future. There's a lot happening, even though the problem is still here. I mean, so do you think there's a discrepancy between what researchers value and what actually, I don't know, what the, I guess, uh, committees that uh, decide, uh, hiring committees um, value? Well, yeah, uh, that's a funny question because actually the hiring committees are normally peer reviewers who are researchers themselves. So, so it's kind of a, a circle, but for some reason... When you're in that position, uh, you, you don't have time. You're not rewarded for assessing people. It's, it's, it's time consuming. So you just go for the number and that's understandable. But at the same time, this difference also comes because universities get a certain amount of money, which is normally based on these publication indicators. So universities need these publications to get the money to fund the research activities to get the material and and so it's kind of a vicious circle and okay so one of your projects actually was about a survey asking researchers uh what they think will advance their uh research versus uh what uh, they want to do uh, with their research and you found out that these two things don't really overlap could you maybe go into more detail about this yeah, well, I mean, I'm exaggerating a bit because, and, and that brings me to another point that's really important. I, if you, yeah, if you want to look at the survey, it's uh, on a preprint right now, so it's accessible online. Um, but yes, actually, researchers also like to publish, and they also like to publish in high impact journals. 
Um, so, but they realize that this is the most important thing for their career. And there are other activities that they like very much that are not beneficial or even detrimental to their career. And that brings me to another point, which is whatever we assess in research builds the research culture. It builds what researchers believe becomes success. Like the way you see yourself as successful depends on how other people see you as successful, right? If, if I tell you that uh, being a good cook for me means that you are the best person in life, well, if you're not a good cook, you're going to feel like you're nothing, <laughs> even if you didn't value it in the beginning. So, so it's just, it becomes part of them. It becomes part of me also. I, I would love to have a paper in science, but why? I mean, just because this is valued by everybody around me, it's not because I want high citations. and It's really just becoming what success means for me. It's like the, the secondary form of uh, currency, let's say in like scientific currency right like yeah. it's, it, everyone values it and it has a value and it's it's like cryptocurrency as well it's it's distributed because the more citations you get the higher the value of it yeah yeah, yeah so yeah. it's i think i mean also and this is people feel valued because they have a higher impact factor like publication in a journal with a higher impact factor mm -hmm. so I, mm -hmm. and this somehow the system is uh it's 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 i feel it's built in a way that it's it, it's not sustainable for a longer time and i think now we're at this point where we're reaching this sort of end of this curve of sustainability of this system which just values higher number of citations and other yeah. other factors like this and we really need to go to the humans behind all of it to understand yeah. the well let's hope so let's hope you're not the only one and that lots of people think that too because I think if we keep going in that direction, we'll end up with way too many papers. That's the first thing. We'll have way too many papers for us to be able to read it. And then they're starting to develop artificial intelligence algorithms to summarize these papers. But, but I think that's not the future. Us spending time writing papers and then... Yeah. I mean, also, it would depend on what trained the artificial intelligence algorithms, yeah. what kind of papers trained it. So yeah, yeah. Uh, again, very, it's, it's, uh, it's a whole other... Uh, I'm very um, doubtful about, or let's say worried about these uh, these new developments. But, but I think you're right. We're at a turning point and uh, things have to change from now. I mean, did you see this? That if the in your um, survey that the scientists were or they wanted to be more open, more transparent about their research. They wanted to, um, I don't know, not instead of just getting like uh, I don't know tens of papers, just uh, putting them maybe more together, making like a nice uh, paper out of it. Uh, well, again, I saw a big difference in in from person to person. I could, I mean, I tried to link it to seniority and I was not able to. So I, I, I like from my gut feeling, I would say, yeah, young researchers want open science, but I don't think that's actually true. I think it really depends on, on individuals. And what I noticed is um, there is a shift. Lots of people participated participated in my research, I think, because they were mad at how research works and, and they were pretty happy that some research is happening in that sense and they want to know when I publish, they want to read the results and everything. So I see a shift, but I also interviewed some people who did not believe in open access. They thought if, if a paper is published open access it means that the journal gets the money for publishing so they're going to publish anything they will publish anything that's even if it's not high quality so so i know that there's still a, a huge lack of awareness um especially from non-researchers uh, like some other research as uh, research actors like in the policy and in, in the university management they're not necessarily aware of all of these things uh, that are happening Okay, so do you think basically that we need to have like better communication between all the actors? To... Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, that's, I think that's the key. I think that's the first thing that we have to do if we want to change things. We need to talk between each other. And we, as young researchers, we need to be involved in that discussion. That's really important. Uh, I think our voices are kind of missed right now. Uh, a lot of policy documents will ask the contribution of researchers, but they will take senior researchers, they will take important researchers, the deans, the directors. But I think early career researchers really have an important voice in that discourse. Um, and we also need to listen. We also need to listen to the journals and to uh, the funders and to other people. Because what I also noticed is that we're not the only one facing the problems. Also, the funders, they face the pressure. The pressure because we keep submitting a thousand applications for funding and they have to review them. And then they cannot give the money to more than 10% of the applicants. Or also the journals, because we say, well, the journals will never publish my negative results, so I'm not going to submit it. And the journals just say, well, we would publish it. We just never receive it. So there's a miscommunication between all these actors that I really think, I'm not sure how we could engineer a forum, a discussion, but we really need to talk. Okay. Yes. I mean, I guess miscommunication is usually, I mean, on all levels of, uh, I guess, human interaction, uh, it's always a problem. So yeah. it's actually a famous saying uh, statement. It's, it says, uh, conversation is the exchange of miscommunications. So <laughs> perhaps uh, yeah. we yeah. need to deal with this from the basic ideology of a conversation between different uh, actors, mm -hmm. between yeah. the different uh, stakeholders in the, this field. Mm -hmm. So who do you think were the, I guess, most open to this conversation uh, of like, the people that you interviewed? Did it seem like, again, more it being like a personal thing that people wanted to talk about this uh, and others didn't? Or that it was more like, okay, some people wanted to def definitely change the system while others were okay, like I'm, I'm fine with the way it is? I, uh, to be honest, everybody I spoke to when, because I started talking about success, then I talk about the problems, the misconduct, and then I talk about change, like who needs to change? And what I noticed is, everybody agrees that we have a problem. Like everybody agrees we have a problem, we need to change, but nobody feels able to change, obviously, because we don't talk and, and we each depend on all these other actors. Uh, so everybody wants the change, but nobody feels ready for for being the one that will say, I'm going to be the first activist and I'm I'm going to change everything. They don't feel able to. So that's also why we need more communication. We need more interactor projects and 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 discussions and and policy making that involves researchers, that involve journals and all of these things. Okay. I mean, okay, so basically no one feels responsible and also they don't feel like they can make a change by themselves. Mm -hmm. So uh, also, but before we mentioned or we were talking about how uh, like right now the situation, it seems as if you're at a breaking point where actually yeah. something might happen. So why do you think this is the case? Why are we at a breaking point right now? Uh, I think because we're so many researchers and and we're also, we know that it's possible to be more open. We know that it's possible to have fair data sharing and to do big science and to share our results with people at the other end of the planet and, and to work collaboratively in huge projects. So we know this is a possibility and we're still stuck in an old system where We publish a little research, uh, we make a little research, we write a fancy paper and we send it to a publisher and it goes into a paper. Like, so I think we're just realizing all the possibilities and all the damage of the current system. Yes, no, I, I mean, I completely agree with these huge collaborations also with CERN, where it's not just one person gets like all the credit, but it's, I don't know, 3,000 or like how many <laughs> yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. 5,000. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they can just work together, collaborate and then publish their findings because, yeah, this uh, seems like a nice system. So It's brilliant to see a supplementary uh, 
data file, which was just the author li- author yes. names and their affiliations. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's also that's also a good point because I think so. I say research assessments have to change, have to look at how we do the science and not just the output. But another point I think is important is that we have to look at the science and why like why is research so focused on individuals we are building our cv and they are assessing you as a researcher like but it shouldn't be individual i don't have any paper that i'm the only one who contributed to that paper and i think science is so multidisciplinary now and so international that it shouldn't just not have names anymore. I, in my, I, I always give this idea of like making science a Wikipedia, but like, because uh, I teach about these topics and I, I think it's a bit absurd that we still put so much emphasis on authorship and on names and on CVs. I mean, uh, if you look at the way science looks at things, because now with so many people looking at similar problems, we actually have different people looking at the same problem from different angles or like slightly different problems, mm-hmm. which may join together or fit in as pieces of a puzzle to give a whole picture. Yeah. So yeah. why do you think there isn't, so is, there, is there a particular reason that people aren't collaborating as much as can be? Or because does this system create so much of an incentive for someone to have their their name being the first author or the last author or something like that. So is there... Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm free thinking here and this is not based <laughs> on data, but, but no one thing that I, I realized is the our scientific system is, is based on competition. Everything is competitive. Uh, our PhDs are competitive and then the position that we get after that and then all the awards that we get during the PhDs and and the funding, everything is based on competition. And the reason for that, and I found out in my interviews because I was a bit confused, like, why does it always have to be so competitive? Uh, and there's really a deep, an old thinking that if you don't have competition, people are just going to sit on their ass and do nothing. <laughs> but it's, it, it doesn't make sense. Uh, I think you you become a researcher not because you want to be rich and famous, but because you want to do something good for, for knowledge and for science. And if they let us not be all in a competition, I'm pretty sure it would be easier. I mean, I have to admit there that, I mean, it's difficult because yeah, yeah. there is unfortunately limited funding. There will not be a, a PI position for every PhD student yeah. that is studying right now. I think statistics say, like, I think I read it somewhere, 3.5 out of 100 PhD student will become PIs. So this is yeah, like yeah, just yeah, yeah. that no, no, I, I, I totally agree. I'm, I'm, I know it's completely unrealistic to think like that. And also you have to evaluate science and to say, okay, only the best science is going to be rewarded. That, that's for sure. Uh, but at the same time, you know, like the, the PhD students in balance versus senior p- position, this is a problem that is not being solved and it's not being addressed. There's still the same number of PhD students entering the system we know now there's less job because of COVID and uh, is it going to come back? We don't even know. But this is a system that we need to uh, to, to change how, how it is done and how it works. And Yes, I mean, we mentioned also had this in some previous interviews with uh, that basically, yeah, there's the number of PhDs versus the position is just insane. And uh generally creating an incentive to have less PhDs, so less people doing like the grunt work, but more, for example, like a research, a research staff, scientific staff that is yeah. uh, they, that are like uh, PhDs that just stay at an institute and do like proper research can help with this. Yeah, definitely. Well, like more differentiation mm-hmm. between the, the, the jobs that you can have when you do a PhD and, mm-hmm. and also teaching you skills that are useful in other 
jobs mm -hmm. beyond academia. That's that's really really important. That I, I mean, for you, your survey, what uh, were the career outcomes that most of the PhDs were thinking about? So were they what did they want to go into science, or did they already know they didn't want to stay in science? Uh, in my survey. Yes. I, I didn't ask that. Ah, I, okay. I should have. Sorry. Yeah, but it, no, it was a mix. But I know from from past research mm -hmm. uh, that it, normally it, it ranges between sixty and eighty percent of the PhD students that say they want to continue in science. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's huge. Uh, in Belgium, there's only one in ten that will be able to, and okay. and that counts part time position. So you know, I like. I will be starting a postdoc soon, and it will be 20% uh, postdoc, so I'll work one day per week. But already just with that, I oh. will be counted in one of these 10 students that got an academic position okay. after their PhD. So it's quite... Wait, uh, so you'll be doing a 20% postdoc position? That's a bit surprising. Yes. Uh, can you explain <laughs> how that, that works? <laughs> well, uh, so I, I really get along well with my supervisor and I wanted to continue this project. But at the same time, um, I want to change things, right? And I feel like being a researcher, it is an asset because I know how science works from the inside. But it's also a drawback because I have to publish and I have to get grants. And, and I feel like I'm blocked in this I'm still blocked in this publishing paper scheme that I have to, to promote my own career. And in, in promoting my own career, I missed the opportunity of changing the system for real. So I, I agreed with my supervisor. I mean, he opened a position. Uh, he had a postdoc position. And uh, I told him, I wouldn't want a full-time postdoc right now. I want to try to work in policy. Uh, I want to try to work somewhere else where, and to see if I make more of a difference there. Uh, but I also want to continue in research. So that's why, yeah. Okay, nice. So basically, this, I guess, leads us to the, to the future. So how, how to change policy, actually, to, um, I guess, make science a bit better. So how do you want to tackle that? I mean, I, I, do you have a bit of an idea of uh, how you can do that? As Myself, one of the things that I'm trying to do right now to change how, how these things are happening is through teaching. And uh, I, I teach research ethics, uh, publication ethics, and, and scientific publishing in my university, now, now online. But I really see that's where I feel that I'm making the biggest change. Because throughout my, my PhD, I've attended a lot of uh, research integrity courses or trainings and normally they tell you okay you should do this you should not do this and but they don't really tell you about the problems in the system and now in these courses I, we have these discussions about the problems in the system and I really see the students are animated and and they they become more activists and I think if I had to say where I'm making a change, I would say it's true teaching right now. That's, that sounds great. Yeah. So are you teaching then all students or are these more also students that uh, learn about ethics and research integrity in general? So it's, no, it's a, it's a mandatory course for all PhD students. Oh, nice. Uh, not my course in particular, but they have to take yeah. ethics training. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I end up seeing almost all PhD students, I think, in mm -hmm. my university. And um, I teach uh, scientific publishing to bachelor's students, oh, which okay. is really, really interesting because they don't know how scientific yes. publishing works. And they're shocked when they hear <laughs> that your paper is just reviewed by I two peer yeah. reviewers and then they decide if, it's, if it goes to be published mm -hmm. or not. <laughs> it's fun to see in their eyes how the system is yes. so absurd yes um, yeah 
No, that sounds really great. Yeah, because generally, I mean, creating more awareness for these issues is, I think, the uh, the way to solve things. Basically, if everyone knows what's wrong and what what we should be doing, then it's easier to do these things, especially future generations. Yeah, uh, yeah. But at the same time, and I think it, I I have like there, there's something that's really important there. I'm also in touch with the the directors of research of my university mm -hmm. we chat we exchange emails mm -hmm. and i think that i cannot put all the responsibility on young researchers we also have to talk about these issues mm -hmm. with senior members of staff and with the university itself i'm in a good position because that's my phd so mm -hmm. i've been chatting with a lot of people in the university mm -hmm explaining to some people who were strong advocates of impact factors how impact factors are flawed and and so i i try okay. to be an activist myself um, okay. yeah, yeah. but i think on my own i cannot do it and that's mm -hmm. why I, we need to we need to become sort of a, an yeah. army of activists uh, mobilize the masses yeah no. yeah exactly <laughs> That's interesting how they, I mean, to be honest, I did not expect that there were like too many advocates of impact factor nowadays anymore. <laughs> That's probably because you're you're in this circle, right? Yeah, like you're doing podcasts on... on... The bottom. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so we you're probably the created a bubble for ourselves mm -hmm. within this uh, yeah. open science mm -hmm. dimension. Uh, so uh, if you, if you, so my question again, was in this direction because you're teaching students now and uh, perhaps these people are eventually going to realize the flaws of the current system. Yeah. So do you think it's going to take very long for the system to change to have more people supporting the cause, mm. let's say, or is it going to be something we can try to convince the older generation people as well and well, something which can happen faster? Yeah, I, I, I mean... I'm optimistic in terms of policy change. So I think the policies will change very soon and the research assessment in institutions will change very soon. It's happening in Australia, in, in the Netherlands. Uh, it is starting to happen in the UK. And once like UK, US, once the big players change, the other ones sort of follow. So, so I think for that, I'm optimistic. But then, like you say, there's a whole culture and the culture change is very slow. Um, but we can, I, I, from doing research on this topic, I've realized that, for example, my supervisor, uh, the first paper that I wrote, I told him, I want to do a preprint. And he said, what a preprint? Why? Like, you're going to put your data out there. And then, and then there's a risk that they will not accept it. And, and now he's the first one to tell me, do a preprint. It's ready. Do a preprint. And then we're going to publish. So I really, I really think that we, we would be, people learn and they get, they become, even if they're extremely established and senior, of course, it's more difficult because their career was based on these old indicators. And if we start valuing open access publications and open data, they might have nothing. So it's, it's scary for them, but I think they know and they learn about the, the value of these indicators and most of the people I've I've met and we had these discussions with they welcome the change. So I to answer your question, I think it's not gonna be too long. Yeah, I, I hope so. Concerning this uh, also more senior research, because I completely agree that if we don't get them on board, it will take just even longer. Because also you mentioned that the environment they create is kind of um, inherited by the people that go to their labs yeah right yeah so uh, the, this breaking the cycle uh, will be <clears throat> I, I think very hard in the end yeah uh, well yes and no because you know i i know we're i don't know if you're parents i'm not i'm not a mother but i have a lot of friends who are mothers and they tell me that they learn more from their children than their children learn from them so i i think even though you think your supervisors or the seniors of the lab are very inflexible and even though they create they seem to create the culture of the lab if more people in the lab believe in open access uh, 
in the end, the value of open access will will make its its way to the to the senior researcher. I I think so. I really think so. Not always, but that's also why the policy has to change. And now with Horizon 2020, Plan S, uh, open science is becoming more and more important, like mandatory. So then the, if there are researchers who are inflexible and they still want to stick to the old system, they will not have a choice to, to move on. No, no, I completely agree. It's, it's nice that, uh, like, I think especially from the funders' uh, side, they're trying to make these changes happen, as you yeah. mentioned. With yeah, and I think they are, they are the big players, the, the funders, the institutions, and, and the policymakers. But I also think that we, we can do something. I, uh, I mean, so basically, I mean, basically, your PhD is being reflective, self-reflective. So research, trying to figure out itself what is it's doing good and what not, right? If, yeah. Right, it's, it's, um, yeah. It's quite so, challenging. <laughs> yes, because yeah, I mean, you have to be honest with yourself. You have to say, okay, we're doing some things that are not good, and so on. I mean, yeah, yeah, and I have to question myself too. Is this like, for example, in mm -hmm. in my. Um, in my research, I had so much interesting data that I thought, at least from, from the interviews, they were mm -hmm. so interesting. And then I thought, but I cannot just do one paper with all of this data. I have mm -hmm. to do more. I have to. It's too much for one paper. So I did two papers. And then I mm -hmm. thought, you know, this, um, this questionable research pra mm -hmm. practice that's called salami slicing. Oh, it's so Take Maybe can one, you just quickly explain it? Yeah. yeah. So you take one research project and you cut it in 20 different papers. So you have more papers out of a simple data. And mm -hmm. I thought, well, maybe that's what I'm doing. So even I doubted myself in, mm -hmm. in my project. And that made me realize that integrity is very complex. I study it every day of my life. And I don't even know if I'm mm -hmm. acting with integrity when I'm I'm preparing my results, so yeah. So maybe as a last question, what do you think early career researchers can do to help uh, accelerate the change uh, the, to a like better system? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so th that's a hard question because I think as uh, we've discussed this already, we're mm -hmm. early career researchers and we can feel a bit like the victims of the system. We feel like we're not very powerful. Um, but I already said, I think we all have a voice and if we put all our voices together, we can really make a change. So that's, that's the first thing. So let's not shut ourselves up. Let's keep talking mm -hmm. about the problems, keep talking about what bothers us and, uh, telling each other what we value in science, telling our supervisors what we value. Be, be a bit activist. I'm not mm -hmm. telling you to risk your career. I can risk mine because I fight for these things. So if I don't publish in uh, science and I publish in Open Access Journal, I can explain it from my career. Uh, but but uh, let's try to be activists as much as we can. That's the first thing. But the other thing is, also with yourself, when you read science, when you read papers, uh, when you talk to your friends who just published papers, we have to think about science differently. So what I mean is, um, I, I was just recently at a, an online conference from Eurodoc, uh, which mm -hmm. is an organization of, of uh, researchers, and um, we had Karen Strobanz uh, talking about research assessment. So I'm going to use her words. But basically, when your friend comes to you and says, I just published my results, mm -hmm. instead of asking, where did you publish it? Mm -hmm. Start asking, what is it about? Is it open mm -hmm. access? Change the way you talk about science. When you build your bios for conferences, don't list the number of papers you've published. Say what you're doing and say how you're doing it and what matters to you. So, so changing the way we talk about science, we talk about ourselves and about our accomplishment, I really think that's how we're going to change our, our own perception of, of science and mm -hmm. how we can really make a change. Well, that's uh, profound, uh, actually. It's very <laughs> profound the way that we have to change 
But I, I think it's true. I think it's true. Thanks a lot for the interview. I think we had a great time talking to you. And uh, yeah, let's uh, see what else will come uh, about from your postdoc then. Yeah, yeah well, I, it was great for me too. And uh, I will keep following up your podcast, that's for sure. Well, and probably your research. I think you, you are doing an amazing job just having this podcast having or, or the conferences and all yeah. the events that you're doing. We need more of this type of people in research so good job thanks a lot the open science team is here to help us yes <laughs> well that was an interesting uh, discussion with noemi wasn't it yes uh, i mean especially the survey was i think quite uh, eye-opening because just seeing that uh, what researchers want from science and what they think they need to do in order to uh, prevail in science are not really aligned and it kind of shows so that cool. i mean i think this was also one of our main points uh, mm -hmm. that the research culture needs some change i mean and the problem for it to be or to come is actually uh, that it's going to be a systematic change and systematic changes are always really hard to um exactly to get. yeah so and also she mentioned that not just people from our generation who are pushing for this also people from the older generation have to become a part of the whole drive for change exactly i mean the whole system like every researcher in the end yeah okay so uh, if you guys want to check out more about this topic the link to her preprint where she has the results from the survey in more detail can be found in the show notes right below and i think with this episode we've come to the end of this long series tentative end of this long series of episodes on the summer of open science and we're going to be starting and sort of continuing in a different direction with a new series of episodes from next week onwards so stay tuned for that i mean we, we hope you enjoyed these topics and because they're very dear to us and uh, yeah and also we understand that they can be sometimes slightly dry but uh, we thank you for sticking along with us and we really want to thank you for helping push us to uh, 1000 downloads on all devices from the beginning and we, we, we really want to thank you for this and this has been a wonderful experience for us we feel really happy that we've reached this incredible milestone in our journey Uh, do you have any any further words, Nico? No, I'm just uh, happy that uh, people seem to like it because, I mean, we are putting some work into it. So I'm happy that uh, people, yeah, listen. Thank you all for listening and thanks for motivating us to actually try to make a better product every week. And I hope we uh, fulfill your expectations. I think with that, we've come to the end of this episode and I'm going to stop talking here and let you guys... This has already been a long episode, so... And if any one of you wants to join our team and be a part of uh, what we're creating here, please feel free to write to us at offspring.podcasts at phdnet.mpg.de. And uh, we, we would really appreciate to hear from you. Also, if you have any feedback, comments, suggestions, please yes. feel free to write this. All right. Offspring Magazine, the podcast is brought to you by the Max Planck PhDNet and the Science Communication Working Group Offspring Magazine. The podcast series is hosted by Srinath Ramkumar, Nikolai Herman, and Alison Lewis. The intro-outro tune was composed by Srinath Ramkumar. The pre-intro jingle is composed by Gustavo Carrizo. Uh, I'll take your leave with all this and see you all next week. Till then, it's a bye from Nico. Bye. And a bye from me. Bye-bye. <laughs>